Very good afternoon to one and all here today. Uh, I hope this is a wonderful Saturday afternoon to you all as well. And this is going to be our yet another Westford webinar series. We're excited to bring in new leaders and speakers who are here to share their beautiful, wonderful journey with you. So let's see what's in store for us today. A company has only one peerless role, Chief Executive Officer. It's the most powerful and sought after title in the business world, more exciting and more rewarding and more influential than any other role. Despite the luster of this role, serving as a CEO can be all consuming, challenging and stressful. But hey, to everyone out there, me and you, me included, all of us in the corporate world, we all have dreamt of having or being or being in a company of the CEO or being a CEO itself someday, isn't it? So today we would like to know what is it? How what is it about becoming a CEO? What is the journey of becoming a CEO? What is it made of? Will the journey you and I are taking today is it similar to that of a CEO? Will our journey that we take today will it lead to someday for us being a CEO? Time will say, I'm sure every CEO has a unique story filled with success and failures. They have friends and families and acquaintances and colleagues and leaders and mentors and coaches who supported them. And today we are going to learn a little bit more about one such CEO. Amongst us, we have an exceptional leader who is extremely humble and excited to share his journey with you all. When I called him a few weeks ago and I, I, I checked on with him, will he be uh, on? Uh, will he be uh, be able to be a uh, speaker for our webinar series? He was so excited. I mean, I mean. I was so shocked by it. But, and when I said that, he asked him, like, what do I speak? So I said, you know what, you can just share a slice of your life. And then he was so quick to agree to that. He's like, oh, more, I like that more than anything, to share who I am with, my, with the people, just to share a slice of his life. So to Mr. Hussein Wahibay, CEO of Fetcher, a little bit more about him. Mr. Hussein is a public and pub a uh, private and public sector leader with more than 18 years of experience in the service industry. Currently, he is a CEO of Fetcher. You all know what Fetcher, which company Fetcher is, isn't it? We all are getting orders right now while we're sitting at home in quarantine or in lockdown. All we do is sit in orders. So we're getting a we're getting a parcel from Fetcher every now and then. Previous to that, he was a managing director of UPS Middle East. Before that, he was the advisor at the UAE Prime Minister's office. And prior to that, he was the managing director and regional director for Aramex. All of them, and most of them to do with the shipping industry and one with the Prime Minister's office itself. So Mr. Hussein is a passionate public speaker and is a very active member of the entrepreneurship community. He has completed the experiential leadership program from Singularity University of the United States and Advanced Strategic Management Program from the IMD Switzerland. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a powerhouse of talent and exceptional leaders amongst us. So I want you all to note down what his success story is, uh, uh, come up with all the exciting questions that you have. So you have, you can see that just a little bit of uh, uh, information here. You have a chat section and you have a Q and A section in the right hand side of your uh, screen. So all you have to do is whatever questions you have while you're listening to this talk, just pen down your questions in the Q and A session. At the end of the session, we will have an hearty, warm one-on-one uh, -on -one Q and A session with uh, you know uh, uh, at the end of the session. So keep all your questions to the end. But in between that, if you want to 
chat about anything, you can you know use a chat room. But questions, my dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, please leave it to the end and into the uh, if you if you if you worry that you might forget, just write it in the Q and A section. So with that, let me introduce you to Mr. Hussein Behbe. So let's decode the success mantra of Mr. Hussein Behbe, CEO of Petra. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sakina. First of all, we have to agree on something. There is no Mr. here. You all call me Hussein. <laughs> I hate the word Mr. Right. Uh, thank you very much for Westford University. I'm very excited to be with all of you here. Uh, for me, it's, it's a great opportunity to, to talk about a story. I mean, it's when we say success, uh, nobody will reach success uh, ever because success is a journey and the destination is very far away. So we learn every day and we can say that, okay, we are we're navigating through good days in our business, but success, again, it's not something that we can achieve every single day or easily. It is a destination or a never ending destination. So I'm very excited to answer all your questions. I'm very excited to tell you about the story, a couple of things, what I faced, what I learned, what do I advise you? And then I can take your questions. And today is an uncensored session, which means you can ask anything now or never. So can we start maybe Sakina the slides? Yes, yeah. Perfect. Let me tell you first about my journey. I mean, uh, when I, I graduated from college, I joined a great company at that time in Lebanon, Aramex. All of you know Aramex. I worked in Aramex for around 18 years. I learned the basics of the, this industry. Uh, I, I worked with a great team at that time. And then after Aramex, I moved to the government. It was a very exciting uh, opportunity to join the prime minister's office in the UAE. I had a great time. I'll tell you later what, what are the takeaways that I learned from working in the public sector. After uh, the PMO, I, I moved to UPS, so I came back to the industry. I went to the public sector and then came back to the private sector because I really missed the, the, the suspense of the shipping industry. So I worked with a great team as well uh, in UPS. And recently I just joined Fetcher as the CEO, still in the same industry. Maybe it's a different channel, challenge, more exciting challenge, working with great people and so on. So the journey has just begun. We didn't reach anywhere yet. So let me go to the second slide, success. Because you know the title of this uh, session is about success. Success is never about reaching any certain title or position, nor it's the matter of which company you work for or the size of that company. It's all about reaching a certain phase in your life where your own reputation, trust, commitment to what you do will keep you climbing the ladder. These are the secret ingredients here that will bring you closer to success. But again, as I said, success is a very long way and it has a lot of challenges and opportunities at the same time. What were really the backbones of my journey? I mean, I had a very, very, uh, I can tell you a tough but exciting journey and a lot of people were, were, were the backbone of this uh, journey and the, they, they were the real people who supported me to reach wherever I reached today in, in, in terms of uh, my responsibilities and even uh, whatever good things I may be doing and people are appreciating. So customers and business partners come in the number one position here. Supportive bosses and leaders, the subordinates, the people whom I worked with, the teams whom I was part of, the community itself, believe it or not, the community has a very big uh, role in, in wherever you reach and the, the highest levels that you reach in any career you have. And of course, you may have some personal attributes here which are embedded in you and they will help you uh, also to position yourself uh, maybe against everybody else uh, around you. Customers and business partners, what are the real uh, the real points that I want to discuss in this slide. First of all, I always built a relation before submitting a quotation. It's never about just throwing a rate sheet 
a price sheet chasing the customer to sign it for you and then you go out no i used to build a relation gradually with the customer we will have the confidence to work together and then you throw the rate sheet or you build the quotation because this is where relationships really matter even if i never won the business from the client i will always keep a good relation and i will always come as a helping hand in case they wanted anything even if they wanted help with somebody else so clients really appreciate that my mobile number was never mine i mean i remember one of my great bosses he told me hussein as long as you are during the working hours your salary number is never for you it's for your clients nothing hidden here any customer used to have my mobile number and i used to help everybody i never said no we cannot do it i know that there are limitations in any job you have based on the on the nature of the business based on, based on the company but we never said no we always try to find a solution for whoever approached me even when i was a salesperson i was still taking calls from customers who wanted things which i couldn't do but i connect them to somebody else i outsource to somebody else i talk to other partners and link that customer who wanted help from me to that partner so that i will keep that relationship honesty transparency and never the hit and run approach i had nothing to hide i was very transparent i never was when i started my career because i started in sales i never was that sales person who goes uh, follows the client chases the client sign with me i want your business and the moment they sign i'm not i'm not there anymore no we were always there for the clients we reward the customer who gave us business by being there with them even if that account was given to the customer service team we still were involved we still visited that customer and the attention was there and there is a big no for over promising always 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 one of the things that our leaders taught us is to under promise and over deliver revenues and profits are extremely important for any business however relationships really last forever so we i never compromised on on my relationship with anybody on the account of getting more profits or more revenues from from somebody else uh my customers yesterday are literally my friends today i mean i'm still connected to customers who used to be my clients maybe 10 and 15 years back and we're still engaged for business and even we became good friends as well in, in the day-to-day -day life i never really thought of cutting any ties because there is no reason to cut any ties in fact these customers sometimes will go with you from a job to a job or from a career to a career my customers themselves were the best referrals as well i mean they were the ones if they were happy with me when i was still uh, in my account management role they used to recommend me to somebody else it, it could it could be their partners it could be their friends it could be their suppliers it could be their own customers that was a great bridge for me to get more business and increase uh, my chances of succeeding uh, in parallel with my peers and in, in any company i worked for uh, ego i mean i'm one of the people who hates ego a lot so there was zero ego all the way up i never changed my attitude i was always accessible to my previous existing and certainly any future customers or colleagues titles will never give you anything or any advantage against others. Titles are just there, as I always say on the business cards, they're important for, for these business meetings because you know sometimes people would like to meet senior people the moment they see their, their, uh, their high title. However, for me, titles are nothing. Supportive bosses. This is really, well, this is the real secret. I mean, I, I remember two great bosses or a couple of others as well, who were the real reason to, to grow me in my business, to groom me to wherever I reach today. I was really blessed by, by having motivating leaders who never claimed the credit for my work, never. And, and they never saw any threat uh, from my success. I mean, uh, usually, you know, you have leaders who will, uh, who will uh, just try to uh, take your credit uh, or they're afraid from you if, because if you grow, then you will not be able to, uh, they will, you will compete with them. I never had these types of leaders. These leaders, they always believed in me. They trusted my capabilities. They empowered me. They challenged me continuously. And most importantly, 
they gave me lessons from my own or from my very own mistakes. Those leaders used to hear things from me rather than hearing things about me. You know, you have these types of leaders who bring, I call, I mean, I, I don't know how to call it, but they have that habit of they want to know about you, how you are performing and from your peers. And this is unhealthy at all, because if they want to know about you, they, not, they want to know how you are performing. Or even if they hear any rumor about you, it's very important to call you, sit with you and hear it from you. There are no conspiracy theories here. Uh, those leaders, those leaders, they really grew my wings and they never had the problem of me flying away, which means they grew me in the, in, in the business, they trained me, they empowered me, they coached me, and they had no problem if I wanted to leave and go for a different opportunity. Because such leaders, they know that wherever I go, wherever I fly, I'll be always flying around them and I will not go anywhere far. I had... I was very lucky to have leaders with no hidden agendas. They were so honest, transparent, and they ignite every spark of passion out of me. Leaders who made me work with them after, uh, uh, sorry, I had leaders as well who, who made work with them rather than uh, working for them. You, you have two types of leaders. You have these leaders who work with you in parallel. You never feel them as bosses and they never have this bossy attitude. And you have these leaders who want you to work for them, which means for their own purpose, for their own credit, and they want to take that credit and, and show it off to their bosses. I never had this, at least with the top leaders whom I worked with. My leaders always celebrated my success and they never exposed my failures. Never, ever. If I did bad, privately, they used to tell me, this is what happened, this is how to, you have to improve. It wasn't really something loud that will expose me among my peers or even among the, the top players above my leaders. They always were very fair with me. I had great leaders who led by example and never by fear. Those leaders, I never had any problem in reaching, out, reaching them out anytime, uh, being very transparent with them. And also from their side, they had no fear factor at all. They didn't really want to be bossy with me. They wanted to lead me get the best out of me, and then in the end, it's a success for the whole organization. It may sound like a dream, but yes, you have such leaders. The subordinates, I mean, I, 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 I would give most of the credit to the great people and the great teams who worked with me. Again, as you see in the first point, people always worked with me and never for me. I never had this attitude. Open door policy gave me also access to everyone at any time. Sometimes you may have a secretary, you may have uh, a PA, personal assistant, but such roles are only important for organizing your appointments, organizing your reports, coordinating your travel, travel arrangements, and nothing else. We had no lock on the door. We had no appointments to meet. Everybody was accessible to me at any point of time. People always appreciated uh, the way I used to encourage them to really cooperate and not to compete because internal competition is healthy sometimes in any business. However, it can cause a lot of friction between uh, departments and, or, and, and uh, functions. So it's better for them to cooperate. And then we celebrate all of us as one, as one team the success. No need for having people competing on personal level with others. Then you will have these showstoppers. You will have people who will, who, will, uh, who will block innovation and new ideas and creativity because they want to come up with that idea. You know, the internal competition is always there. I never encourage this at all. Uh, uh, it's better to, to cooperate. I never promised for anything that I can never control or influence. You have a lot of leaders who will promise people about an increment, about a promotion, about a bonus, just maybe to buy some time. And in the end, they may, have, they may not have the full authority uh, to implement this. And this will cause people to lose trust in you and leave the organization as well. Okay, it's good to be a boss in the office sometimes. However, I'm, I'm always a good friend and mentor for, for all my subordinates. Uh, there is there's no need, I mean, to be always bossy. And in, in the end, we are all in the same level. A friend is a friend and a colleague is a colleague anywhere, be it in the office or outside the office. Pushing people to their limits 
for the purpose of developing their own skills first. Yes, I used to do this and I still do this. I push people to the limits, uh, within limits, of course, because I want them to learn, I want them to grow, I want them to develop themselves uh, uh, by, by, by just giving the best out of them. And of course, the outcome will always be uh, the result, because when you push people uh, or, or you, you coach people to give the best out of what they can do, then definitely will get results. Accountability has never, ever been negotiable. I mean, delivering results is, is a must in any business. But you always get what you deserve and more as long as you deliver results and you perform. That's my, that's my own style. If people perform, I can give them a cherry on the top above what they want as well. Uh, the credit always used to go to the team. Because me as a leader, I never really cared about this tap on the shoulder or I never wanted to please any boss of mine. Never. I mean, uh, it was always a self-challenge. And for this, because I never wanted any credit, the whole credit always goes to the team and nobody other than the team. Um, I have and will, till the last day of life, I will always battle the corporate bureaucracies and the office politics. These are extremely toxic, unhealthy, and these are the nightmares of every single corporate culture. So there is no room for this. I may join any company. I may find this available. I will never, ever navigate with it, and I will fight it till the last breath, as they say, because people don't want this. Community. The community has an extremely important role and, and the success of any leader and any organization. It's, it's, never, uh, it's never too late to start having your own corporate social responsibilities individually and as, as corporations because it really pays back a lot. From an individual point of view, I mean, a lot of people in the community supported me because of the trust and because of the great things that we had together. Uh, many people whom you usually you meet in one of those events and you know within the first handshake you have that brilliant chemistry you have a chat you have a coffee together and you never see each other again however these are the people behind the scenes who re recommend you and recommend your business the moment they are chatting with somebody else and a requirement comes and they will remember oh you know we know hussein who works in this company we met him once this is his number he can help so this is extremely important uh, the incredible support from the government partners who always value your social contributions and they appreciate your loyalty to those countries that embrace your businesses and your families. I mean, in any country you operate in, it's extremely, extremely, extremely important to, to be very socially active, to contribute to the community, because not only they will see you as a brand, uh, which is adding value to that community, also they will see you as a leader was always needed to work with them in parallel to improve the overall uh, citizen experience and the situation in that country. So you will never be only flagged as the expert that's in, in logistics. No, you will be flagged more as a contributor. And this will, of course, increase your chances of success and being ahead of others. And never under underestimate the, the power of word of mouth. Word of mouth, you know, today it became a digital word of mouth, as we say, because of the social media and all the, the channels that are there online. But for me, it was extremely generous and it helped me a lot in reaching wherever I reached today. I, I always look for opportunities to help others rather than only helping others who approach me for opportunities. It's good to take two steps ahead and try to help others around you who are looking for jobs, people who are looking for opportunities, some people who are looking for mentorships, startups, small businesses who want your help. It's okay to invest in your time whenever you have time. And take this as, as, as a rule. If anybody tells you, I don't have time to help startups and entrepreneurs, tell them that's not correct. Because when you want to have time, you can spare some time. That time is extremely valuable for them and it can make or break their business. Personal attributes, I mean, I don't want to talk about myself here, but uh, it's important to know what are the things or what are the, 
uh, the attributes that I had maybe built in me that helped me as well in, in, uh, in, in growing and climbing the ladder. And nobody is perfect. Um, of course, neither myself. However, I had no enemies. Never ever in my life I had real enemies. It was always a matter of having, you know, the difference in point of views, people who think differently, the internal and external aggressive competition. Yes, when I say aggressive competition, I had a lot of aggressive competition internally and externally as well. But that's very healthy and this is what keeps you on your toes. Positive energy is what keeps me always self-motivated. I mean, believe it or not, my, my positive energy is self-generated and this is why I'm always motivated. I shouldn't really worry about everything and this will allow me to focus on delivering results and, and, and leading people in a very positive manner. I have zero tolerance to ego and arrogance. When I say zero, I mean even minus zero. These two attributes are very much popular within the business world for different reasons. For me, I do not tolerate this. And I, uh, whenever I deal with somebody who is having arrogance or ego, I just ignore that person, step back until they fix their attitude and know how to deal with others. Uh, what you see is what you get. Nothing to hide. Transparency is always there. Uh, Self-motivation is, is extremely important. I mean, it was always my cure pill against disappointments. Because when you expect from everybody to tell you a good job, you will be very much disappointed. You need to understand that not everybody is, is really happy to tell you a good job. You know, people are always, not everybody wants to celebrate the good deeds of the others. So because of the difference in mindsets and mentalities, and maybe some people will be jealous from you and your work and, 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 uh, or compete with you in your, in your working environment. That's why better not to expect a good job from anybody. It's all about challenging your own self, celebrating your own self, admitting your own mistakes, and of course, taking these as lessons for improvement uh, in any area that you have to improve within your own personality. People centricity. I mean, I love people. I just, I'm a very social person. Uh, that's why I, I participate a lot in public speakings and events. Although I was a very shy person in the past, but I took a couple of uh, opportunities and then this is where my, my potential, I started to explore internally my potential. I care about people before profits. And then I will share the profits with the people who generated those profits. Because when you put people before profits, the profits will come automatically through these good people. There is no way that you will have happy people in your organization who will never perform. Never. If they're happy, they will perform. And this is where profits will come. And then you have to share with them these profits. Make sure that they are rewarded for their contribution in the company. Customer obsessed is literally an understatement. I mean, this is a problem. I can, I can, I can tell you it's a problem in me. Uh, and I'm a very tough customer when I deal with anybody else. So when I go to a bank or to any counter, I observe how I'm being served. I mean, I give sometimes my, my, my comments, but because I'm myself, I'm a tough customer to everybody else, uh, I have the customer obsession. And that's why in every business or in every company I worked for, uh, we used to do def different things to be able to jump in and help any customer on the spot quickly without having any delay in, 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 in that. I mean, I can talk about this for two or three days because there are a lot of ways you can do that. Maybe you can do it in a different session under a different topic. I want to tell you a story here. This story happened in 2009. And really this story, it sparked my, my sense of empowerment. Um, I was working in, in one of the previous uh, great companies and uh, we were handling a very big exhibition for, uh, for a public entity. That exhibition, it required moving tons and tons and tons of uh, paintings and, and furniture to another country so that they would participate, that entity would participate in an exhibition. This exhibition had a deadline. Uh, everything moved on time from, from the UAE, however, Nothing really arrived on time at destinations. And, and you know, you had a couple of days for the event to start. It will be disastrous, literally, if things are not fixed in that exhibition. 
and placed on time, it will be a big issue for the company, for the brand, for the reputation, and of course, for my customer, which is a very important public, uh, public sector entity. So what I had to do is I had to send four people from here, four senior managers whom I trusted very well, to fly to that country and to work very closely with everybody else on the ground. And they did a lot of good job there. However, the expense of that travel arrangement and whatever they had to really uh, uh, incur in terms of extra cost and a lot of cost because it was a very big uh, project, the numbers were really scary. So what really, I mean, the story is not really in this this uh, this uh, project. The story is in the feedback from my boss at that time, my CEO. When my CEO knew that I took that decision without even getting back to him to, or to anybody else because I was already empowered, when he saw the numbers, he did not really care about the numbers because he saw the outcome of this. And you know what he told me? He told me, thank you for your leadership and thank you for taking that decision to save the image of the company and to save the reputation. Why for me this was a lesson of, of empowerment? Because the same job or the same project that I told you about now and any other companies, I'm sure, I'm perfectly sure that it could have never happened in this way and it could have never maybe happened or the, the, the appreciation could never happen in this way because a lot of companies will bring the calculator and tell you, oh, you have incurred a loss here. You shouldn't have done that. You should have taken a different approach, even if you couldn't do it. So empowerment is extremely important. When a boss thanks you for taking the extra mile, which usually is a very tough extra mile, this is where you can never look back and you will always look for such opportunities to take quick decisions by knowing that you have a great boss above you who will appreciate that and make sure that you will take the right decision without thinking about financials or anything else. What are my takeaways from working in the, in the, in the public sector? Uh, when I worked in the government, in the public sector, I, I really had no idea about what will I see, what's the working environment. I can tell you that this was one of the best uh, years in my life because whatever I learned in the public sector, I will never ever learn in any school, in any college, or even in any private company. I, I learned a very good lesson, which is there's a very big difference between working uh, for a company and working for a country. Yes, working for a country never really felt like a job. I never felt like going uh, on an eight to five job every single day. It was more of a very incredible opportunity uh, to positively contribute in improving the lives of 9.5 million customers. When I say 9.5 million customers, I mean the citizens of this great country. And then the salary, as I mentioned here, naturally comes as a return of your efforts. So I used to call it always, it's a paid contribution. It was never about the salary. I even could have done it for free because the feeling and the sense that you have from serving 9.5 citizens along with a great team, I cannot explain to you how beautiful is that. Uh, we, we learned a lot to aim for being the number one in everything I do. And this is a bit tough for whoever is gonna work with me in the future because it will put you almost on the edge of perfection. We learned this from His Highness Sheikh Muhammad. He used to always say that you have to aim to become or to be the number one in everything you do. And this is why you always see the UAE trying to take the first position and, and all these great initiatives that are happening every single day. When there is a vision, everything is, everything is possible. This is a lesson that I learned at the government as well. Uh, when you work with aligned people who, who really work passionately for a purpose, it's not about for the money here. When you work in the public sector, it's for a purpose. So I worked with a great team, one hand towards one purpose, extreme passion, and towards executing those second to none visions of the leadership of, of the country. So when you experience that, Trust me, you don't want to go back and work in the private sector where only you have calculators, numbers, and revenues that are being uh, talken about. Uh, nothing also really matches the pleasure of and the pride of working for the benefit of, of the public. Because when you work in the public sector, every single contribution, even if you had the 0.5% of contribution, this will benefit uh, the whole public. So there's a strange feeling which I really cannot explain to you through this presentation. 
what did I learn from, from working in the private sector? I mean, the private sector is a different ball game. Uh, but I learned that nobody is better than you in whatever you are the best in doing. What does this mean? Many of you here are more qualified maybe than your own leaders as well. So sometimes a leader will, will, will show as if he or she, they understand more than you. That's not correct. If you are a good technical person, if you are a good creative person, if you are a good uh, finance person, you may be 10 times better than anybody above you, even reaching the CEO and whatever you are good in doing. So keep this always as a sense of pride because without you, they will never really be able to do whatever is supposed to be done, especially for the people who are experts and, and whatever they do. So if you are an expert in whatever you do, be happy, be proud. You're better than your boss always. Uh, when you start a new job, never play your cards from day one. I mean, everybody will join any new business or any job. And they're very excited. They have the passion to, you know, throw all the cards and from day one. My advice, don't do it. Play one card at a time until you get to know the partners. You will know who are your opponents and then you will figure out what are the rules of the game. Then based on that, you can shuffle your cards, play your greatest cards left and right, prove yourself and then grow the organization. Uh, Empathetic leadership is never a weakness. It's always a strong attribute that really doesn't really exist in weak leaders. I mean, sometimes if you are a leader with empathy, people will think that you are weak. Forget about that. The more you are empathetic, the better you are as a leader and the stronger you are as a leader because you have the courage to show your positive emotions rather than acting as a very solid big boss or a tough boss and people don't want to deal with tough people. A good corporate culture is every organization's retention engine. People will stay with you forever if you give them a great corporate culture, which is built on the right basis. Uh, uh, and if you remove all the negative points that I mentioned for you in the first or second slide. However, having a corporate culture by itself is a science. It's not something easy which you can bring consultants or advisors to tell you how to build your corporate culture. It should come from within, from the basics of, or from the, from the, from the first day of the foundation of the organization, you will have the basics that are there. This is where you have to build on this and continue in evolving your corporate culture in order to retain people, have a great working environment and grow together without any obstacles on the way. Uh, the biggest mistake that you, that you can ever have, in my own opinion, is not to have a plan B. Having a plan B is very important, not because you're just sitting there working and then you want to jump into another job after one month. No, but when things go wrong, when things, let's say the COVID-19 today, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people were thinking that they're going to stay in the job forever and they have plans for retirement in these companies. However, because of the uh, unexpected situation, they have lost their jobs. So what are their other options? If they had a plan B, at least they could have not struggled maybe to stay in the middle of the bridge. Always have a plan B. Uh, it's good to be loyal to your business, your companies, your bosses, but think of yourself and have a plan B in place. At least keep it on the shelf and, and, until you need it. If you don't need it, at least you will have it covered. The first day of your real journey uh, towards success will start from the first day you check out of out of your comfort zone. I mean, I worked for 18 years in, in one organization and I gained a lot of knowledge. I gained a lot of connections. I gained a lot of experience. I enjoyed knowing hundreds, maybe tens of tens of thousands of people. But still, when I did a job hop, I changed my job. This is where I felt that I'm really out of the comfort zone. I was able to explore more things, learn more things, and then move forward. It's okay to stay in a job for a long time, as long as you're happy there, as long as you have a stable stability. But again, it's excellent to explore something else if you had the opportunity while being loyal maybe to your previous work or previous job or previous employers and, and, and working together in a, in a different uh, format uh, and rather than just dis disconnecting. What are the things that push me away from any business? 
I hate sugar coating. I hate materialism. I cannot stand corporate politics, bureaucratic environments, or outdated mindsets. You always have to work with people who have innovative mindsets, people who want to change, to move forward, creative, and this is how organizations grow. You cannot stay in the old mindset forever. It will never work. Arrogance, negativity, favoritism, credit wars, these are very time-consuming, energy-consuming, and nobody is a winner. When you get into these four bad things, everybody is a loser. Nobody wins. Hidden agendas and lack of transparent practices should never exist in corporates and organizations. Never. We have to be transparent with our people, be it good, be it bad. If it's good, we celebrate together. If it's bad, we work together to improve it rather than pointing fingers. So transparency is extremely important. Egoism, selfishness, and bossy attitudes. Why do you want to be really having an ego or you want to be selfish or just practice your bossy attitude against the great people who work with you, against the people who are the reason of your growth, against the people who do all the job to make sure that you and your organization are successful. I just cannot understand why leaders have ego, why leaders want to just show their muscles on the people who are below them. And by the way, the people who are below me and below everybody else are 10 times stronger than me and any CEO in this, in this, uh, in this world because they are the ones who are making things happen on the ground. So they have to be bossy rather than, rather than ourselves. Another story. I would like to tell you this story. I mean, this story is a funny one. But when I started my career in, uh, in 2001 in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, I was, as I told you, a salesperson. I think during the first week of my, my sales role, uh, I was excited to go and do sales, uh, cold sales calls. You know, a cold sales call, you don't take an appointment. You just go. I used to choose a street in, in, in Beirut, enter the shops without any appointment. I was, you know, holding, holding that... Uh, branded uh, folder with offers inside it and rate sheets just to enter will you work with me through a rate sheet let's get in touch uh, there was that specific shop which was very shiny very big one it was a silverware shop so i entered that shop even without knocking the door and and i saw um, a very angry woman who was, she was sitting inside because i was holding a folder or a file she thought that i was one of these you know sales people with the bag who are coming to sell her any any product and items and apparently she suffered from them a lot so the moment i told her good morning my name is hussein i work in x company i just want to sell i i just did not continue my word sell and she jumped from her seat she started shouting at me she kicked me out of the shop in a very loud voice go out i don't want to see you guys you always come without appointment don't waste my time i was very upset by the way because it was an insult for me and it was the first time i ever faced this in my life so I walked for, walked for two steps and then I came back to her, entered and told her, listen, I wasn't coming here to sell you anything. I had a customer, I worked for this company and I had a customer who is based in the Gulf region. He wanted to, do, to place a huge order of silverware and kitchen items. And he told me to go and find for him the best company which he can source from and import uh, uh, to his country. So my role was to find that partner, hook him with that uh, um, customer in the Gulf, and then I will ship it for them. So in, it seems you don't want the business. It was maybe a multi, multi million business, multi million dollars business. You don't want to work. I'm, I'm leaving again. Believe it or not, that lady turned into an angel and she ran after me in the street. Come back. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Let's work together. But I did not look back. This incident gave me the confidence that, you know what, when you have the right product, right service and uh, you're you're covered by the right brand on your shoulders then you have nothing to worry about you have to have the confidence confidence to set it without uh, second thoughts so since then i never hesitated to do cold calls knock knock the doors of any customer i felt that i can add value to uh, without having this incidents uh, incident uh, affecting me so it was an incident that gave me uh, uh, we call it a ripple effect here that allowed me to do it more and more and more rather than stepping back and having this at the back of my brain as a fake. 
What are the big X's uh, in my dictionary? These are, I mean, these are the words or the sentences that I, I sometimes heard from some people or I hear them around. And for me, maybe I can put a big, big X on these. That's how we've been doing it always. Uh, this, is, this is something that, I mean, it's, it's totally wrong because the moment you, 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 you say this, it means you will always still live in the past. You will never progress. You're never thinking of innovating to really take a competitive edge. You cannot do the things the same, uh, in the same way you used to do them before because you will become yourself and your organization as obsolete. It's not my job. How many times people, you come to people and tell them, please, can you help this client? And they will tell you, it's not my job. You know, I work in a different department. Please give it to somebody else. I'm totally against this because everybody in the organization will have to serve the client irrespective of their role. Sometimes you may need an extra helping hand. It's okay to step out of the comfort zone and do that specific job. Everybody is having one job, which is serving customers. Stress is part of our work. Get used to it. I mean, how can any leader tell their people uh, this, this, uh, this sentence? It doesn't make sense. No, stress is never part of the work and people will never have to get used to it. There's a different way of maybe rephrasing this. You can say hard work is part of our work and we need to keep on doing the great job, for example. This is where I would stress myself to deliver to that leader, uh, to, to deliver to that leader rather than hearing such things. Social media and socializing are a waste of time. I mean, how many times many of you here are afraid to be active on social media because you think that your boss, your CEO is going to say, oh, this person is wasting time on LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever it is. No, at all. In fact, today, it's the only chance for us with one click or with one uh, post, social post, to reach hundreds of thousands of people. And these hundreds of thousands of people can be customers, potential customers, existing client, suppliers, or future partners. So why not? Be very active on social media. Uh, uh, reflect your personal brand, reflect, reflect the brand of your organization and never feel your bosses. And if any boss comes to, to, and tells you you are wasting time on social media, please tell this boss to speak to me directly. Uh, I'm the boss here and I decide. Many of you may have faced this. I mean, this is, this doesn't work today. We are in the, we live in an era whereby the boss is, is, down with you in the field. The boss is there to have collaborative uh, decision makings with all the team rather than having one single decision which may not work with everybody. Of course, I'm not saying that you will go to the boss and tell him I want to always be part of your decision making. However, the way bosses sometimes uh, have a one uh, my way or the, or the highway is a bit painful, especially for millennials today. I mean, millennials today, they're not used to this. They want to socialize with their bosses. They want to be close to their bosses. They want to be part of decision making. They want to give and take. Social responsibilities do not pay our bills. I have heard this a couple of times in the past when I had uh, several bosses about me. And this used to really irritate me because leaders who do not really see the value in the social responsibility and the corporate social responsibility, then they, they shouldn't be there. It's not about only doing money and profits and then taking these monies and profits and putting them in the bank. Of course, it's very important to do that. It's extremely critical to, to, uh, to be profitable, but again, contributing a bit or a portion of these profits and revenues to help the society and to, to contribute to the society is, is something that not only will pay your bills, it will position you ahead of anybody else in the future. And this is where opportunities will open for you as an organization because the community will pay back by giving you more business. Uh, bring the business first and then we improve the service. No, at all. You never have to wait for the revenues to come so that you will really fund the improvement of your customer experience. A client who doesn't face with you a good service today is never going to come back. Never. The client will never wait for you to correct your mistake in the future or to improve your performance in the future, either now or never. So please invest in, in improving the service and the business will come by itself, I'm sure. Everybody is replaceable. And this usually happens when, when a boss 
uh, feels guilty about losing people, but they don't to admit it, they will tell you it's okay, let him or her resign. Everybody is replaceable, so they cannot twist our hand. This is not correct at all. Everybody is replaceable is not correct, but every function or every um, every job is replaceable. I can tell you maybe yes. Every vacancy is replaceable, yes, but not every person. I have lost a couple of people in the past, uh, and they were the best people ever. But I didn't really have the power to maintain them because maybe at that time I was not really having the final call and really giving them the financial package that they wanted or really give them the career that they wanted. Because sometimes it's not only you, you will have a lot of players above you, so you lose such great people and and they are not really replaceable. And I've never seen people like them ever who, who really filled their own positions. Who are you? Why are you copying me on your emails? When you work in big organizations and when you have the, the leadership ego somehow with some people, of course, not everybody. Uh, many people will be irritated if you copy them on, on an email where you needed their help. And sometimes when you CC a leader here, it means you need their help. Because you don't want to send them directly, you CC them because you expect from them as leaders to practice the leadership and jump in and help you. But you have another part who are afraid of problems and they will not tolerate you copying them on the emails. So instead of telling you, thank you for copying me, I will help you, they will blame you for copying them and putting them or taking them out of the comfort zone. Who allowed you to reach me directly? I mean, I cannot understand also leaders who, who, who deal in, the, in this way with their people. Nobody, everybody should be reachable. Okay, I understand that there's always, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the layers in the company will not allow everybody to reach the top, but again, in the end, whoever is trying to reach you is trying to reach you for a purpose. It's because of them, it's because of the customer, or it's because of something that's good for the organization. So again, these big X's for me, I don't like to hear them from anybody and I do all my best to never say them to anybody as well. What are the tips from the heart? Look, these are very, I mean, when I say from the heart, I really mean them. And I can, I can put for you maybe here a guarantee, a sign on a, I can sign on a paper, that, that these tips will add a lot of value to you during your career and they will help you a lot while moving uh, forward and climbing up the ladder. Uh, always leave a legacy and a stamp wherever you work. Uh, history never dies. Everything good that you do is always going to be remembered by the people who work with you. It's going to be remembered by, uh, uh, by the way it was, it was archived because you know everything you do, even the public things that you do are archived with one Google search, you will find the good things, the good reputation about you. And this is what will keep you really growing and, and, and instilling the trust in everybody who wants to work with you. Uh, treat your people today in the same way you expect them to treat you if they become your customers or employers. Today, if you have an employ employee and you treat that employee very bad, imagine tomorrow that employee goes and joins your top customer and he becomes the decision, or he or she becomes the decision maker, what will be your embarrassment here? Treat everybody in the same way you want them to treat you in the corporate world. Uh, arrogance is a shortcut to isolation. It will never grow your muscles, never ever. Avoid it, keep it, uh, keep it in the box because the more people are arrogant, the less people want to approach them, work with them or make business with them. Uh, never allow a toxic environment and never ever accept being part of it. Sometimes you will tell me, Hussein, okay, it's not our decision. We can't, we have to live with that because you know, we need to work. At least try to battle it, try to change it, try to positively lobby. By the way, there's something called positive lobbying within any organization, which is a good thing. Good people stick together. Good people try to change things positively. Identify who are the good people within the company and gradually remove that toxic uh, toxic environment and replace it by a positive one full of positive energy and, and, and happiness. You are the real brand and everything else is a combination of letters and logos. I mean, really mean that because when you work for an organization, you are the real brand, you reflect the right brand and all these beautiful colored letters are called logos only. A brand without a soul is only a logo. 
and you are the soul where everybody else is, is a logo. So be proud of the brand that you carry on your shoulders, reflect it positively, and this is how your brand or your company and organization will reward you back, and then you will grow and succeed and become a CEO and a chairman, and also maybe uh, an owner of, of that company. Make sure to build uh, a reputation that makes you wanted like nobody else. What do I mean by this? Today, if you lose your job, okay, and you, if you're jobless, the moment you, you declare that, okay, you know what, today I'm without a job, you want everybody to jump in from different industries and say, I want to capture that talent because that's the great person who can join my team. Irrespective if he or she do not have the experience in the industry, but they have the right attributes, they have the right attitude and caliber to get trained, learn about the industry and become part of the team. You need to be that person and you can only be that person if you follow maybe all the advices that I gave you uh, throughout the previous slides and the tips and the small tips about your personal attributes. When I say that build a reputation that makes you wanted like anybody else, I mean, you have nothing to hide, nothing to be ashamed of, and many things to share and to be proud of. And as I told you, anybody who wants to do a background check about you will ask the people who work with you, and they will go and Google everything that was mentioned about you on the internet. So when you're not worried about this, you are the right person to, to be in the right place. Too much knowledge and experience are literally worthless unless you are very generous and, and sharing them with others. And when I say that, I mean, I always tell everybody, donate your knowledge. It's good to donate your knowledge. I mean, nobody should pay you to earn your knowledge and experience. Why should they? Sharing knowledge, sharing experience will not only improve the lives of others, it will improve the overall situation of the ecosystem that you belong to, the community that you belong to, and it's good for humankind in the end. So nobody wants to really die and take the knowledge and experience with them because by then nobody will benefit. Thank you. I think um, that's it for now. Uh, sorry if I talk a lot, but I'm very much excited and, and interested to, to hear your questions and answer on anything uh, that you want me to answer on. I can see your comments, by the way, and I really appreciate your, uh, your feedback. All right. Okay. Uh, let me just publish this. Okay. There are like our Q and A section is flooded with questions. So thank you so much, Mr. Hussein. Your 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 conversation and your open um, open session. I mean, you're just, you, it was just having like a we're sitting over a coffee and having a conversation with you. It was really enriching. So there are a lot of questions here. So let's go with the first one. Uh, you mentioned. Okay, one second. The first question is, Mr. Hussein, what does Fetcher stands for? Is your personal attitude, does it come from your own experience or, or is it because of the way how you were raised? That's a very good question, by the way. Look, Fetcher, I mean, um, everybody hopefully knows Fetcher. Fetcher is a, is a tech-enabled logistics um, player. Uh, they were before focusing on the, on the last mile deliveries while leveraging on the great technology that we have. And now Fetcher is transforming more into an end-to-end tech-enabled player. I'm not going to tell you the tips and secrets of, of, of where we are heading. Hopefully, very soon, you will hear the good news. But Fetcher is a very good, agile, aggressive player in the, in the last mile logistics, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, leveraging on the great technology that they have to really change the way packages are moved uh, across the world. Uh, to answer the question, um, I mean, yes, it's a mix of both. I can tell you if I had if I hadn't really experienced the great leadership that I was exposed to, I may not have thought of implementing the same. It's like a baby. When you raise a baby, you know, from, from day one, that baby will grow based on how he or she were treated. So definitely a big credit to the way my leaders and my, my, my subordinates uh, uh, treated me. That's why I'm treating everybody the same. Secondly, it's a personal att uh, attribute. It goes back maybe to the way you were raised as a person, the background that you come from, and if you want to be a good person or no. You shouldn't really be a good person because you want to just sugarcoat and show people that you're good. It will never work. People will feel that you are faking it. So it's a mix of both, definitely. Absolutely. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, next question is from Mr. Mubarak. He's saying, Mr. Hussein, how do we inform bad news to the team? For example, a salary cut or maybe a few months, a uh, few months of job layoff. How do you inform a bad news to to your team? Well, informing bad news should be transparent. Yeah. I mean, if you don't inform them, they know it from somebody else. The moment I have any bad news, I always call for the team. Explain at least you will call first the executive team, make sure that they understand the situation so that they can cascade it down to their people in a very transparent way. The worst thing ever that can happen in any company is to hear the gossips and, and the rumors because bad news sometimes it can be inflated in a certain rumor format that can damage the whole organization. So, from the first time there's something going wrong, be transparent with the leadership that you have and let them cascade it down while explaining how you will also be, be, be fixing that issue. Never hide critical topics on your people. Never. It will backfire on you as a leader and on the, on, on the organization. Thank you so much. You yeah, are being honest and authentic about how you want to approach it. That's brilliant. Next question is from Mr. Marshall. He's asking, working in a courier company, you need to have contacts with people all around the world. How did you get those contacts, A? And then on... And how do you trust them? And how did you cover the entire region in getting the contact? Like, for example, if you're based in Bay, how do you get the contact from all over the world? What is is it? What's your Look, when you work with, I mean, I've proudly worked with uh, with multinational organizations, and I was exposed very much myself and the great team that I was working for. Because I don't like to say the word my team. I mean, my team. I'll tell you later why I hate that word. But with the team that I worked with, we were exposed to maybe thousands of customers across the world. Because, the, you know, the, when you work in the, courier, in the shipping industry, you're not talking about shipping within the same country. You will be having cross-border shipping, cross-border uh, transactions almost between every single country in the world. You know, you have these beautiful networks that are connecting each other through the, through the infrastructure of the organization. So definitely we know a lot of customers across the world. And these are still in contact with us, maybe not for business, by the way, but for different things. But this industry is, is, is a very important one that gives you a lot of connections. Yes, because you are there to help people wherever they are, wherever they are based. Getting a product on time, getting a parcel on time is something emotional and everybody will never forget the good experience. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Asher. He is working in the software. He is working as a software developer uh, and designing. So he's asking, how do you build rapport? What is your, what is your mantra of building rapport with people? Look, the rapport will always happen. In my opinion, the rapport will happen from the first two minutes, from the first handshake, as they say. You know, that smile and the handshake, and you look into the eyes of the other person, you will feel the chemistry immediately, and you will say, that's the right person to work with. That's the right person to trust. And definitely trust is not only about a handshake or, or a smile. It's more of how you, you, you start that relationship. I mean, how you, you build gradually the trust in that person. And the moment they trust you, they will trust you blindly. And then this is where you will have an eternal relationship. There is no need at all for you to have a bumpy start because in the end, whoever doesn't click for you with you from, from the first couple of minutes, it's going to be over. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, we have another question by from Mr. Hossa Mehdi. He's asking, is it a good idea to join a new company now during the pandemic? What do you say? What do you mean by new company? Like, I mean, is it good to change jobs or is it a good idea to look, during pandemic? Change is always good, of course. I mean, if you are having the opportunity to join another company, a stable company, or even if it's not a stable company, but joining this company for a certain period of time will give you a, a, a different uh, vertical of knowledge and experience i mean why not you have to take risks if you can afford it you have to take risks sure thank you so much and the next question we have is what is the most challenging part this question is from miss amna she's asking what is the most challenging part of your business during covid 19 what is the most challenging? And the most challenging part is, is look, I can tell you something in, in, in our team. The, let me tell you the opportunity before telling you the challenge. We have the most, and I please allow me to tell them one by one through this setup that I'm very proud of them. We had the most resilient team I've ever seen in my life. Resilience is extremely important that kept the whole team on their toes, serving customers, 
and performing as if there's no COVID-19, number one. That challenge is really, uh, I mean, navigating within COVID-19 now and delivery, the delivery industry is having, other than the opportunity of, wow, that you know there's a lot of business, the capacity issue. Capacity issue is becoming a challenge in this region and having enough uh, delivery infrastructure in the countries that we are operating in needs a bit of maybe improvement to allow you as uh, a player in the industry to deliver a good service. Again, also the curfews and you know the things, the closure of uh, roads, the closure of, uh, of cities is the biggest challenge here, but hopefully this will be over soon. But as, uh, in spite of all this, the team has been performing perfectly well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, we have more questions. One second. The next question is, uh, Mr. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, what is your personal vision for the market in the UAE? How do you see this? How do you see the market in the UAE? Uh, the, the, UAE, the UAE has proved not only during COVID, during every single situation in the past, that it's one of the most resilient countries in the world. I mean, this is a great country which embraces challenges and turns these into opportunities. It's a place where I will always work in. I would love always to make business here. I would love always to complete business for one reason. There is always, there are always two steps ahead of, of uh, everybody else. And maybe they work on a proactive mode to prevent things from really going uh, uh, down, down, the, down the drain like and, and maybe other, other bigger countries and maybe more advanced uh, countries across the world. So I, I'm positive, I'm very optimistic. We, can start, we started to see the recovery in the UAE. That's because of the great vision and leadership of this country. And I'm extremely positive. Of course, you will have a lot of different businesses that will suffer but maybe the transportation industry and the logistics industry is booming and the boom is here to stay. So let's okay. take it positively. Things will be okay. Okay. So that's the vision. It's going to be positive going forward. Exactly. Next, we have a question. Do you think, uh, Mr. Hussein, that being into sales is one of the key ingredients in your career to have reached the role of CEO for a company? And is it necessary to stick to one industry to master it? And so that, or is it okay to, and be in different companies, yeah. Look, I will not be fair for my friends in finance, for my friends in, in operations or HR or any other function to say that. No, uh, a CEO can be can come from a financial background. He can come from an operational background. I have a lot of friends who are CEOs and they were before finance managers, HR managers, operations managers, procurement managers, not necessarily. And for me personally, I can tell you it helped me a lot for one reason. I learned everything because when I was in sales, I was involved in customer service, pricing, numbers, uh, uh, selling commercial activities, operational, because when you sell something, you have to be fully involved with everything that's, that's which you're selling to the client. So you have to make sure you understand the operation. You have to make sure to understand even HR as well. I mean, before reaching a level where you, you have HR managers working with you in parallel and reporting to you, uh, dealing with people on the ground, dealing with customers will give you the good experience to have an, an all-round personality, maybe to become a CEO. But again, no, it's not necessary for any CEO to be from the sales background. They can come from any other background. They have to have the right attributes and personal attributes as well. It's not about the experience. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Hussain. Next question is, how do you deal with toxic personalities in a management team? How do you deal with them? I ignore them. I mean, look, I, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of toxic people in, in my career. Before, look, when you are on a junior level, you are afraid from these people because, you know, they, they can cause you to lose your job. But when you grow and grow and grow, you will have the power. And look, a CEO's power is not really to, to, to put that power on your people. No, I will always use my power wherever I have it, whenever I have it, to defend my people from toxic people who are hidden somewhere within the organization. And when you put this as a culture and as a loud message, a toxic person will, will, will literally uh, detox him or herself because they know that if the top level know that this toxic uh, attitude is still there, they will not be with, with the organization. So it's a mindset and it's a culture that you have to really cascade down. But if I, I again, yes, I was a victim of toxic people in the past. I used to ignore them. 
and and move forward without really going into into uh, battles and wars with them. Okay, so great. That's a good advice. Focus on yourself and ignore those toxic. Yeah, situations. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look, a toxic people is tox a toxic person is very toxic because he has a problem. I mean, personally, they will have a problem and they want to show that they're superior than others, or they just want to block everything. Just when you ignore them, uh, they will be alone, and then they will they will maybe hopefully improve. We can help toxic people sometimes. I have helped a lot of toxic people and in changing into positive people, and I noticed that they were toxic not because they're bad. I mean, they were great human beings. However, there were circumstances. Uh, that made them really toxic and negative. So we turned them into great performers and they're still in their organizations now and among the top people. So it depends. Are you toxic by default or are you toxic by a reason? Yeah. Okay. That's a good question thing to think about. Uh, next question we have is, uh, Mr. Hussein, how do you manage your work and personal life balance? How do you balance this? How many hours do you put in work on a weekly basis and how, how do you manage your personal life? Um, that's a good question look um it's tough i mean today everything is open uh, with the internet having and the inter and, and you're accessible to everybody all the time it's extremely tough i mean my children always tell me okay can you stop your email now let's play together and the same thing for my wife but um, i cannot disconnect i try as much as i can to give time to my family while not also ignoring maybe the urgent things that come i mean many of you here may have sent me personal messages uh, for help in a delivery of shipment, uh, let's say on LinkedIn or anything, and just I leave everything, jump in at least to fix it, fix it on the spot or give it to the right person in the company in any organization I work for, and then go back to play with my kids. So it's good to balance, but because, look, you cannot only say I'm totally disconnected from work uh, uh, because I want to have my personal life. It doesn't work these days. I understand that it's a must for everybody, but during these tough days, you have to balance between both yeah true okay i and you have to care about your customer in the same way you care about uh, your family okay so how do you so uh, just the second part of the question in on a weekly basis how many hours do you put do you have a distinctive hours that this many hours i work this many hours i'm with family or is it yeah the, the, many places? Look, my, i mean the only time when i'm not really connected to both is when i sleep <laughs> and sometimes in my dreams in my dreams i <laughs> I, I, I work. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, it's, there is no, somehow you're balancing it, but there is no mantra to it. You okay. cannot 100% balance it. I mean, look, it doesn't really affect me negatively. I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy with it. When you have passion to what you do, uh, you can balance it and without affecting anybody. I think that's the thing. I think if you're passionate about what you do, then you don't feel like you're balancing. You feel, you feel like you're living a full life every day. Great. Yeah. All right. So the next question we have, the somebody, uh, uh, Miss Anna has posted this on FB because in FB we are uh, live streaming as well. So there's a question over there. Uh, in an organization, there's a lot of favoritism and partiality amongst the leaders. So as, a, as an employee, how do you, because this is demoting for the employee, right? So how do you, how do you deal, how, what do you suggest? How do you deal with favoritism? Look, look, when you started your presentation, you said that everybody is having a dream to become a CEO, correct? You just mm. had, that's how I started. My only dream to become a CEO was not because of the title, because I wanted to be the ultimate decision maker to stop such practices, which I was a victim for of maybe sometimes in my life. I'm not, I mean, you will always see this food. irrespective of how good the organizations you will work in, but big organizations will have such situations. And the only way you, you just cannot, you cannot stop it. As I said, you have to be battling it somehow but when you are on a top level where you, your ultimate decision making power is there you can kill it and you can kill it immediately it just needs you from the top to come and say this will never happen in my organization and whoever wants to do this can work somewhere else the moment you do that as a ceo nobody's gonna ever do it but the problem is in big organizations a lot of layers and lot of layers so such things will never reach the ceo again this raises the question okay if you are a very busy ceo and you have billions of things to do the most important thing is to ensure to drill down at least drill down sometimes and hear the people's feedback what are they facing don't take it from the seniors around you don't take it from your management team never go down i mean roll your sleeves listen to people take cases seriously and this is when toxic people or the people who are doing these problems in the organizations will know that the the, the top management are involved fully involved so then they will stop this 
by default. All right. Okay. That's There's one true. question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. There's another question that's asking, uh, what are your interests and hobbies apart from work? What do you do for fun? Well, I used to fly drones un until regulations started to become tougher. Um, I play music and uh, I like to write. Uh, recently, I started to, to like that. I mean, people, every day I have a post on LinkedIn and people tell me, how do you have time to post on LinkedIn and write? I tell them a post will never take me more than 10 or 15 minutes in the evening. But I just like to write. I'd like to, to I like to mentor a lot of uh, startups. I mean, I have a lot of great startups whom I always engage with. Uh, we go and meet and just, you know, uh, be part of their su future success. So sharing knowledge as well, believe it or not, sharing knowledge is a hobby. Oh, be it great. through writing so. or mentorships. Great. Uh, we have another question by again from Mr. Marshall, but I'm condensing the question because part of it was already answered. I would just want to know, like, how did you grow in such a short period of time? So what is your one key secret in a, such a short? What short? What short? It took me 20 years to reach here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look, uh, the answer really, really was in, 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 the, in the backbones that I showed you in this presentation. It's all about the people who supported me. It's about, about the customers my some of the personal att attributes and by being my, yourself okay. by the way even sometimes by being yourself if your boss doesn't like you because you're too good to that boss you will never grow but i was lucky to have great bosses who believed in me and who pushed me to the maximum and this is what i'm gonna do today everybody who would work with me is gonna have the same treatment that i had and even much better no sugar coating here that's a fact Thank you so much for that honesty. Our, our, our Q&A section is flooded with questions. So uh, guys, I'm really sorry. I'm just going to condense. I'm just going to take a few questions, which is like in a combining few questions here, because I do not know if you have the time to take all of them. Sakina, I have. If you want, I'm here for the people. I can stay till whatever you want. Just All right. OK, fine. So let's go one by one then. All right, guys. So um can you give some advice about how to enhance your own personal learning and what is according to you the best way of learning to reading promote, is very important. promotion in your career that's what reading i mean you have to read read a lot it's good to read a lot whenever you have time read books read articles educate yourself uh, reading is is, is is a very is a very good vitamin for your brain okay Great, thank you. Um, reading, guys. Next question. How do you see blockchain making logistics more efficient in MENA region? And how do you evaluate the adoption of blockchain by far? Like, how, what's your opinion on blockchain? My personal regards to my friend, Ihab. That's a great question, Ihab. Oh, it is? Uh, blockchain, yeah, blockchain is, uh, is, is still needs, and it's not really mature in this region but uh, it's gradually moving forward uh, in, in slow steps. I mean, looking into blockchain in the logistics industry in specific, the value of blockchain is, is really huge because tomorrow when blockchain is, is be becomes more popular and active, you will always be able to know the source of every single box, every single parcel, every single, especially for the cargo business, blockchain will allow you also to protect your best interest as a company when you talk about compliance, when you talk about the embargo countries. Today, if you you can move any box from any country to any country, if you change the documentation, you will never know, for example, the origin of that country. But with blockchain being in place, every single cargo, which is gonna move from point A to point B to point C, you will know the real origin of that. So in this case, you will protect, because you know, in the industry, there's something called embargo. Embargo means you cannot send certain certain type of, of material from a certain country to a certain country and if this happens it's very risky on organizations blockchain is going to fix this is part of what blockchain is going to fix plus of course the documentation that happens and the plenty of formalities that happen are going to be much seamless with, with the blockchain but again it's still immature but for logistics it will add a lot of value Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ahud Khamis is a bit curious about your music and writing. So he's asking, what music do you play and what do you write mostly about? And probably where can well, they read? Okay. Music, uh, I'll tell you a secret here. My parents uh, tried to put me in, in music class when I was a kid and I always failed. I mean, the teacher used to kick me out and say, this guy is not really qualified because I never learned the, the, you know, the music notes. I never knew them. 
I never learned them, but they're so they're very tough for me. I just hear music and I play it on a keyboard after I hear it. And this is where I fly when I'm hearing music. Because by the way, my great ideas or bad ideas, I don't know, they come when I'm playing music or when I'm hearing music. Uh, sorry, what was the other question? Uh, what do you write about and uh, where can we read it? I write, I mean, no, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I almost every day I have almost a post. I just write about business, about uh, different things. I'm not really a person who just promotes any, any, any company I work for every single day and every single post because people will be bored. It's good always to promote your company, promote your organization, but also diversify your content. Talk about leadership. Most of my posts are knowledge-based or experience-based. I never go to Google and cut and paste and then, you know, make a very attractive post. I don't like it. Everything yeah. is there. What you see is what you, you get. Great. Okay. Uh, next question from Johnson Pinto. He's asking, you have mentioned that you want to be the ultimate decision maker. How do you make up your mind that the decision you're going to taking is right or wrong how do you gauge that S sorry i couldn't hear you can, can you repeat the uh, uh, johnson peter he's asking that you said that you have you ultimately you are the decision maker isn't it so how do you how do you know that the decision that you're making is right or wrong what is look, look i have to be here clear no again i'm not it's not my way my way or the highway when i say ultimate decision maker only when you want to stop the bad practices in your organization which means, again, if we said the toxic culture, the bureaucracy, the corporate politics, yes, I will stand and say it's only my decision because this decision is going to improve the whole organizational culture. But when it comes to business decisions, of course, I always, I will never take a decision on by myself, especially at the critical ones. It's always a collaborative decision making with the team that I work with, with the executives that are with me, so that we can take the right decision for the right for for the organization. But when it comes to cutting down any bad practices, yes, I'm happy to use that power and to stop that now before yesterday. Okay, great. Uh, we have one more. Uh, we have, okay, sorry, it's a couple of other questions going back. Um, um, hi, Mr. Hussein. How is the logistic market situation in the current time with the existence of COVID-19? And what is expected in the next two to three years? What is your vision for the next two to three years in the logistic industry? The logistics industry, especially the last mile and, and uh, the B2C delivery business, is now in the, in the middle of a huge boom. And COVID-19 has changed the whole landscape of our industry. And the online business is growing almost at a 600% growth pace in certain countries. Uh, the way uh, businesses are going to change, everybody is now running into what is called a digital transformation, going from the retail, traditional retail within the brick and mortar into an e-commerce online B2C platforms. And this will require a lot of efficient logistics players on the ground to either upgrade their current infrastructure build capacities and most importantly to to uh, include technologies here because going into a very basic delivery process of picking up a shipment and delivering an excel sheet will not work anymore here customer experience has to be really mastered when i say mastered it means you have to deliver on your promise before you deliver a parcel so yeah. capacities should be worked on uh, uh, technology should be worked on uh, infrastructure should be worked on. I mean, you don't really need the huge infrastructure and warehouses. You can work on a very balanced hybrid model where you can outsource during spikes and peaks, and then you can have your own fleet during the normal days. So there are a lot of a lot of business models that can work out. But I can tell you, logistics and last mile in specific are are seeing their golden days now, and this will stay for a very long time, if not for the so we are lucky, I mean, to be in this industry. And I wish that this prosperity in the industry will, will really touch other industries in the future. OK, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Abu Mansuri is asking, what's your take on doing a master's in supply chain and logistics from Dubai? What's the future for such a course? Look, uh, if it's Westford, of course, why not? I, I'm sure they have some good programs. That's not a paid advertisement, by the way. Let me tell you something. Uh, look, it's very, it's it's a good, it's a good uh, topic. I mean, supply chain and logistics is embedded in almost every single uh, industry and function, and it's the most critical leg of every of, of every uh, industry. Because 
every product needs to be delivered. So that's why supply chain is an integral part which you need to include in your knowledge, experience, and even if you study it, it will add a lot of value. Because tomorrow, if you work as a head of operations in a retail uh, client, you if, and if you have a master's in supply chain and logistics, you will master dealing with us as logistics players, and you will understand the tips and tricks and where the bones are buried, as they say, buried. And then uh, you will you will prosper in your job. You cannot work as an operations manager for re retail industry and you talk delivery, but you're not really an expert in it. They will eat you alive. I mean, the, the shipping companies will eat you alive. Be careful. True. Thank you so much, Joe, for that. Next, we have a question from Mr. Ahmed. He's asking, you mentioned that customer problems should always be met with a solution. And if not with the organization, you can always, uh, you can, how can a problem be sort out sort of outsourced. I think he's asking like, do you have an example of of, of, uh, of a situation where you had a problem and you couldn't find a solution, but you outsourced the problem. So yeah. you outsourced the solution. Very simple. I mean, you may have a customer who will come and tell you, I want you to ship for me, for example, uh, let's say ship a horse, for example. But you don't have that, uh, that service. So either you will tell that guy who calls you, oh, sorry, I cannot ship a horse. Or we don't have the service. Or you tell him, you know what? I don't ship a horse but I have good connections and, and companies where they can do it for you. I will speak to them now, let them call you, and I assure you that you will get the best attention. And then I call that person whom I know from the industry who can ship horses to call this customer and serve him. I mean, as simple as that. Instead of saying no, mm -hmm. I told them, no, I don't have it, but I can arrange that for you. This okay. is where, where really the, the loyalty of that customer who called me is going to stay forever. And they will always come to me for things that I can handle or for things that I cannot handle. So oh. it's just, that's how they will stick to you. Perfect. Yeah, I, absolutely. It's about about commitment, showing that you can or cannot help, but being very authentic and honest about it. Great. Yeah, because you have the intention to help him or her. I mean, you know. Correct. Yeah, I agree. Uh, next question again from uh, from our uh, listener from in Facebook, Anna. She's asking how important is team building. Please throw some light on interaction uh, amongst employees, as I have few people who are working in organizations which has a very robotic culture, work, 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 straight go home, no interaction, no other engagements at all. So how important is team building, according to you? It's, it's I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about the importance of this. Uh, that's why I always tell now in any company I join and I tell people we, 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 we are here to make money while having fun. Make money for the company, make money for ourselves while having fun. Uh, team, team, team building is very critical because if people are not working together in a team-based structure and in the mindset of, of, uh, of working as teams, uh, it will never work. I have seen a lot of silos in different companies. And the moment you work with silos, you will see the robotical, robotic way of, of doing business. Then people will never give the extra mile. They will never overperform. They will just give you what they want and they will be planning to leave. I, I maybe I had a bit of the experience of knowing psych psychologically a person who's really here to stay or that person is, is trying to leave. And my role as, as an executive to ensure that he or she are happy to stay in the organization. So if this requires a change in the culture, having more team engagement, enforcing, because I always say empower before enforcing or encourage, sorry, before enforcing. If you cannot encourage people to work in a team team based environment you have to enforce it it's not an option okay sure thank you so much for that so uh, another question i'm just taking a question from the chat box right now mr hussein Hosni is asking do you think being working in one company for a long time is a good decision and does it impact on your profile's positivity or does it have an opposite um, impact? i think i mentioned this in the past there is no answer of a yes or no if you are working in a company where you can retire forever but you are sure that this company is going to retain you, is going gonna, is gonna to keep you there, is going to take care of you, is going to grow you, is going to appreciate you, is going to invest in you. I mean, why not? You can yeah. stay there forever and you can retire there. But it's always a personal decision. It's always if, they've, if the, your value is really uh, there or no. If your value is not being highlighted and appreciated, no. It's, I mean, it's not bad to leave and change. It's good to, to explore more opportunities or different opportunities. I know a person who stayed for a company from day one till forever. And when I used to ask that person, why are you not leaving? He used to say, I have no reason to leave, literally. 
I have no yes. reason to leave. And this guy really retired in that company. But in principle, it's a personal decision. From my side, when I left and changed a couple of opportunities uh, for different reasons, of course, and these were all positive reasons, um, I'm very happy. I gained a lot of experience. I, I learned a, a lot of different aspects of the business. I experienced different uh, knowledge uh, and information. So, so it's up to you. But, but for the profile, look, usually recruiters, the recruiters will say, oh, you have stayed in this company for 20 years. That's not good. I disagree with that. I oh. literally disagree. And also when they tell you you are a job hopper and you changed every year, also I disagree with that because people who change every year may have the reasons. Yeah. They may not have fitted in the culture. They may have bad bosses. So they don't want to burn out. They change careers every year. It's okay. Correct. I mean, that's not really, we don't want to have people being judged because they stayed for 20 years and they were loyal to the organization or because they jumped after three months because the organization organization was not bad. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just a question from Loyola. She's asking you whether when you moved career from uh, private to pu pu public to private and, and you moved back to logistics, was that, was that change challenging or was it interesting? Well, uh, it was interesting, not challenging at all, because when I was in the private sector, I never uh, I never imagined that I would really have the privilege to join the public sector. But when I worked in the public sector and the government, again, as I said, I never wanted to go back to the private sector. I was extremely proud and happy and motivated in what I'm doing. And still, I went back to the private sector, but my heart is still in the public sector. I mean, my dedication to the public sector and to the citizens and every because well, as i say always in my posts a customer is a citizen and who takes care really of the citizen is the government and the, and the public sector so you will you will never go back totally to the private sector i still engage with my 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 partners and colleagues in the public sector i still contribute and always look to contribute positively to the community and to the public sector but the mix is very good the mix is extremely good because you'll be you not only be money focused, money is extremely important and money will always come. But what, what you learn and practice in the public and government work is incredible and really unmatched. Okay, great. Thank you so much. With that, I think we've officially come to the end of the questions. A couple of people who've asked a question whether this the recording of this session will be available. Yes, the recording will be available. It will be up uploaded on youtube very soon and so you can you can have an access to that question anytime and you can follow mr hussein Wehbe on linkedin if you have any further questions that is not coming to your mind right now but probably later on anytime of course anytime yeah. so thank you so much mr hussein it's, thank you. it's an absolute pleasure to have you it was Same such here. an interesting session it was like having a conversation or a cup of coffee it was really great and uh, thank you once again thank you everybody ladies and gentlemen who attended this uh, this webinar and for your participation for your patience and for your questions and for your curiosity thank you so much um, thank you everybody thank you. really thank you yeah. i appreciate it thank you we'll stay in touch thank you so much take care and have a safe day take all right take care